science enthusiasts, my name is Jason Zakowski. I'm a high school chemistry teacher and a science communicator, but I'm also the dog dad of Bunsen and Beaker, the science dogs on social media. If you love science and you love pets, you've come to the right place. Put on your lab coat, put on your safety glasses, and hold on to your tail. This is the Science Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Science Podcast. We hope you're happy and healthy out there. Well, <laughs> school has started. We're in the swing of things. I'm very, very busy. I'm cutting the start of this together much later on a Sunday than I normally do. But not only do we have a lot of stuff going on with school, we have a lot of stuff going on with Bunsen and Beaker. Um, we are really close to launching the P3 community with our patrons a.k.a. the Pop Pack, and then that's going to be rolled out to the public. So it's something that Chris and I have worked really hard on all summer, as well as the ebook. Text from Bunsen, the ebook is cooking along. Thank you so much to everybody who's picked up a copy. Um, your reviews are so glowing, and it's it's making us it's making us so proud of the work that we did on the ebook. Speaking of school, Chris has a new position at the high school teaching math, and it's made her really busy. Um, and the dogs, I think, are missing her a bit. The good thing is that Adam and I have picked up the slack and um, I've figured out a way to live stream the dogs to to the P3 community. So I'm checking in on them every day um, and throwing them treats with our furbo. So, you know, they're not completely all alone. OK, on the podcast this week, what's going on? Well, in science news, we're going to take a look at some new research that is about one of my favorite planets in the solar system, and that's Saturn. In pet science, we're going to take a look at catnip and mosquito repellent. And our expert guest is this gentleman. Gentleman's name is very tricky to say, but we're just going to call him Dr. K. We are going to chat about physics with Dr. K. It was such a good discussion. He's so passionate about physics, and you're going to go places you never thought you'd go. Hey, dogs, did you hear of the one about the neutron that walked into the bar and asked how much he would be charged for whiskey? While well, the bartender smiled and said, for you, no charge. <laughs> okay, that is a classic. I'm not taking responsibility for that one. All right, I'm with the show. Because there's no time like science time. This week in science news, let's chat about space. You know, I'm kind of partial to a lot of space news. We had the JWST. They're hoping to launch that Artemis rocket. We talked about ants a while ago. So, you know, it's not always about space, but there's a couple planets I love. Of course, I love Earth. I mean, it's the only planet with dogs and um, other things I like, like video games and, and my wife, probably my kids. <laughs> um, but when, when you look at the pictures of the planets in our solar system, Definitely, there's two that stand out. No, not Mars. I'm talking about Jupiter and Saturn. And forever, scientists are so fascinated with Saturn because of its massive rings. There's new research that maybe points at a way that those rings were formed. So if you see a picture of Saturn, you know it's got those gorgeous rings. Those rings are relatively young, 150 million years old or so. I love this fact. If the dinosaurs had telescopes and they looked at Saturn, it wouldn't have rings. So that's how new the rings of Saturn are with the history of our solar system. Isn't that a wild fact? I love that. Also, something smacked Saturn and tilted it. Like it's not as tilty as like Uranus is, but Saturn is kind of smacked a bit. That's why those ring, when you look at Saturn, sometimes you see it kind of tilted and those rings are even more spectacular. Okay, well, what is the idea behind why it's tilted and where the rings came from? It's up for debate, but this new paper outlines a fictitious moon called Chrysalis that met its demise and knocked, knocked Saturn around and made the rings. Now, this paper gets into some pretty detailed uh, physics and um, celestial body movement it has to do with a little bit with the Cassini spacecraft that fell to its death within Saturn that took a bunch of readings. That Cassini spacecraft was orbiting Saturn for a while. I think like 12 to 13 years it orbited Saturn and um, it, it, it took a bunch of readings and it found out what was its, you know, what the rings were made from. But as it plunged to its death, it took a bunch of data as it 
fell through the different layers of Saturn until they lost the signal from whatever killed it. Gravity, the the ammonia cloud, something, something took out the probe. The theory is that as, as Titan moved away from Saturn, as moons do, there was another moon that I mentioned called Chrysalis that started to tilt the orbit of Saturn. And the next planet, Neptune, also had an impact. Saturn is tipped 27 degrees from that doomed spacecraft. The team got enough data to figure out something called Saturn's moment of inertia. That's a measurement of how much force it's going to take to tip a planet over. So from that data, the team ran simulations. One of the simulations had a little smallish moon named Crystallis. And as Titan, Saturn's, Saturn's biggest moon, moved away from Saturn during its early development, that smaller moon started to sync up with the bigger moon. And there's complicated gravity that happens. That little moon got messed up by the bigger moon and started the moon on this very weird orbit where it got bucked around Saturn. As the simulation ran, eventually the smaller moon got too close to Saturn and started to skim the upper clouds. That destroyed the moon and grounded into little tiny pieces. Those little tiny pieces are now the rings of Saturn. What is the probability of this being correct? Because this is a simulation based on the data and in the in the paper that they wrote, if they have a little moon and they have Titan slowly moving away from Saturn, this scenario only occurs about 17 times out of the 390 times they ran the scenario. Is that is that a good chance? Well, it's within the realm of possibilities and probabilities because giant rings like Saturn are rare anyways. When we look at theories to what how things came to be so long ago, we can only use the data that our spacecraft beam back plus the simulations done on Earth. The more data we get from Saturn, the clearer the picture becomes. If you like it, put a ring on it. That's science news for this week. This week in pet science, let's talk about catnip. If you've been following our Twitter account, we've been doing this really fun thing with Ginger, thanks to Dr. Sebastian Ball, who sent us six socks with a cat attracting plant in each one of them. Well, one doesn't. It's a control. But the thing is, is we don't know what's in each sock. And obviously, neither does Ginger because she's a cat. And so that makes these these catnip socks a double blind study. And we're doing this double elimination tournament where where a sock has to lose twice. But once a sock loses twice, the doc's going to let us know. And obviously, when we get to the finals, he'll let us know which is, which is the winner and the runner up. So it's really fun. And that's where this study I caught, caught my eye that we should be talking a little bit more about catnip. Now, if you listen to the, the side chat episode or the podcast episode with Dr. Ball, we went into what catnip does to a cat. However, this study looks at the the destruction of catnip and how cats could actually cats could help repel mosquitoes by chewing up the catnip. Okay, this is a silly study, but it, it's a fun one. And it, it gets into some really fun science with cats and, and an unintended consequence of them messing around with catnip. So when catnip leaves are crushed, they emit these volatile organic compounds called iridoids. Yeah, it sounds kind of it sounds kind of silly, but these iridoids act as an insect repellent. We talked about this like years ago on the science podcast. Um, we had folks asking us about citronella, and I was like, you know, when citronella is put up against placebo, it doesn't do any better. But it's the smoke from burning those citronella candles that is the deterrent, not the actual citronella itself. But but I did say, guess what? It might be surprising, but catnip has some some kind of chemical in it that repels insects. Now, as these iridoids are released, this is what makes the cats go bananas. Well, one of the chemicals. And because they're being crushed up, there's a greater release of the chemicals as opposed to the leaf. So my guess is that in these socks, we've got some crushed up stuff. So there's the, that the, the chemicals are released a little bit better. This study comes from iScience, and a researcher in Japan was watching um, his cat mess around with silver vine. Silver vine is another cat attracting plant. And um, he put two and two together like, oh, that's, I wonder what happens. I wonder what's different between a crushed up silver vine 
and a normal silver vine. And at, through the testing, they found that when the cat messed with the silver vine, like bit it and scratched at it and rolled in it, it released 10 times more iridoids than leaves that were uncat touched um, in comparison. Now, how does this relate to insects? So when the leaves are crushed up, a specific iridoid is released 20 times more than an intact leaf. And that's that nepatilatone I probably talked about in a couple episodes ago. That's one of the active ingredients that makes cats go bananas. Not only do crushing up these cat attracting plants release the chemical that the cat seems to cat seem to really like. It also releases more of the insect repellent, the mosquito repelling chemical too. If we just had a lot of cats playing with a lot of cat attracting plants, the cats would be happy and we'd have less bugs. Now there's a problem with this. I think we can all agree. And the researchers pointed out, you shouldn't probably have cats out around unsupervised outside messing with cat plants because I mean, you shouldn't have outside cats in the first place. So it was an interesting observation. It's a wholesome one to talk about the science, but I guess, I guess if you're having trouble, put your cat on a leash, get yourself some silver vine or some catnip and have them crunch up the leaves and play with it. And you might have a reprieve from mosquitoes. That's pet science for this week. Hey everybody, before we get to the interview section, I thought I'd let you know how you could help out the Science Podcast. The Science Podcast will always be free to download. You'll never have to worry about paying for it. But here are some ways that you can help us out. Number one, check out the merch store, www.bunsenburnerbmd.com. The merch store has adorable gear, the beaker stuffy, and now text from Bunsen. Number two, think about joining the Pawpack community. It's going to be replacing Patreon, so thank you Patreon supporters. But if you aren't part of the Pawpack, we'd love for you to join. Our new community will take what we do on Patreon and supercharge it. There's going to be so many cool perks to joining the Pawpack community. Look for it in the next couple weeks. Third, think about reviewing the Science Podcast on a podcast player and giving us a great score. It really helps. Back to the interview. It's time for Ask an Expert on the Science Podcast, and I am thrilled to have Dr. Constantinus Constantino with me today. Uh, But I think we'll just call you Dr. K. How are you doing today, Dr. K? Oh, hello, Jason. I'm very good. Thank you. Thanks for being a guest on the show. Oh, thank you very much for having me. I mean, I'm overexcited to to be part of this. <laughs> we were just chatting. You're. I usually ask people where they are in the world, and you're in Finland. Yes, I'm based in Finland these days. The last three years. Now, I'm are born. you like you're you're there for education or your your doctoral work? Um, are you are you from Finland? No, I'm from Greece originally. Right. Okay. But I okay. live abroad the last fifteen years. Oh, so you're a globetrotter. You're moving yes. all over the place. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I did my PhD in uh, in London, in UK, okay. at University College London. Then I moved to Cambridge for uh, three years as a postdoctoral researcher. And after that, in uh, end of in January 2020, I came to Finland to carry on my research here. So but pretty- originally, I studied physics. Yeah. In Greece, in Thessaloniki. Thessaloniki is a city in the northern part of Greece. It's the second biggest city in Greece after Athens. I studied physics there in the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. And then I did a master's in computational physics. Wow. Which, yeah, which is where all of this started related to my research. Now, I have to ask you, Doc, um, mm-hmm. getting into physics and then getting through a doc you know, getting your doctorate. First off, that's amazing. Congratulations. That's very mm-hmm. awesome. Um, but what got you into science in the first place? Like, this is a big deal to pursue this, your whole life's work mm-hmm. uh, in physics. What, what got you into it in the first place? This is Discovery Matters, a collection of stories and insights on matters of discovery that advance life sciences. Brought to you by the people at Cytiva and driven by our curiosity for all things science. And we've actually heard that it's got real health benefits. One listener told us that she started running faster thanks to listening to us. So do it for your health or for your curiosity. 
Either way, give us a listen and a rating. I will use um, what my mother usually say about me as a child. I was constantly asking why. <laughs> why this? Why that? Why we should do this? Why we should go there? Why is this like that? <laughs> and why this three-letter question is actually the driving force in science. I mean, if you don't wonder, if you don't want to explain how things work, then you cannot really go on in doing research at the PhD level or the postdoctoral level or, mm-hmm. and so on. Later on, when I, st- uh, when, I understand, when I understood why I liked physics, I was fascinated from the concept of building models how I can rationalize mechanisms and behaviors of how things work. Everything started from the Newton's laws, of course. I mean, I was completely fascinated from this, uh, fr- from the science that this person gave to us. Hmm. And by the age of, uh, after, uh, let's say, primary school, I was already convinced that I'm going to study physics. So even really? though I could, yeah, even though when I could. Were, when you were a little Constantinus. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> Well, everything started with the wondering why, even to unimportant things. But then through school, I mean, I was, I was 100% sure that I want to do this. I'm completely fascinated from the concept of explaining mechanisms of how things work. In nature or in materials or in uh, machines, such kind of things. Amazing. So, you know, from a, I'm a parent, uh, my, my two sons are older now. Uh, but did you drive your parents crazy with the whys? Was it, were they like, just because get out of here? Um, if, if my mother, <laughs> if my mother was a different person, probably yes. But because my mother, she has a very strong personality. She knew how to keep me quiet. Okay. Uh, otherwise I would have driven them quite crazy. <laughs> That's funny. That is, you know, what's really interesting is that is a common thread for a lot of scientists I talk to yeah. is they were the kid that just never stopped asking why. Um, and I, that you're right. You're so true. It's so true. That is a fundamental part of science. If you don't want to know why, I don't think you can do research because isn't that the whole point of research is the why? Uh, exactly. And considering after me having this kind of 15 years of experience in doing research, considering of how many obstacles you need to overcome Mm. in order to achieve your task. Uh, If you are not driven and passionate about this, then you cannot go through. I used to say to my students that if you are not a masochist as a person, (laughs) as a personality, you cannot be a researcher. Because the downs during this process are many, many more than the ups. And the journey is very long. So if you are not happy to be part of this through this kind of uh, turmoil, then you cannot do, then you cannot do research. You know, but it's good to level. Be honest that there are so many setback, setbacks in research. Okay. You may, I, like I talked to an exoplanet exoplanet uh, scientist, and her entire PhD um, turned out to the the answer was well that didn't work. <laughs> so she spent like two or three years of her life gathering all of this data. And the conclusion was, well, that didn't work. Um, but it's still, a, it's still an answer, right? That's the thing. I, I completely understand this. I have seen this happening. <laughs> and in general, in science, one thing, that, one thing that we don't really appreciate much nowadays, or we never really appreciate it, is that what we can learn from the failures. It's okay for all of us to publish papers, to promote our research, to say how exciting uh, things we are doing, publishing in nature. But what about all of this data and all of this research we have done that it, it failed or it didn't lead anywhere? We don't, really, we don't really have the machinery or the know-how how we can exploit the information from failures. Hmm. But this is a kind of a bigger discussion. I mean, as a scientist, we are afraid to say that Oh, this didn't work, or I failed, or I made a mistake. How we can, how we can retrieve some information from that that we can become better in the future? Yeah, even mm. though something doesn't work, that's still an answer to a question. Yeah, absolutely. 
right now you're dealing with some pretty high level physics. Could you talk a little bit about the work that you're doing? Let's say the general aspect of the research that we are doing is called computational physics. Right? Computational physics, uh, the last uh, two, two decades, have become very popular in science. And why is that? Is because the increasing power of computers from one side and the development of efficient numerical algorithms from the other side. Actually, a lot of people, they think that computational physics can be considered as the third way of research nowadays. So we have experimental, theoretical, and then we can have computational science. Hmm. That's what interesting. Are, yeah, it's very interesting because what are really computer simulations? Are uh, How can we say? They are in silico experiments, which they can act as bridge between real experiments and theories, while also they are able to connect microscopic to a macroscopic behavior of a system. And they have a lot of positive things. We can study complex systems. They are relatively simple and inexpensive. So you are a chemist, right? So you do experiments in a lab. In a computer simulation, I can blow up things. <laughs> and and, and no, nothing can happen. I mean, I, can, I, don't, I didn't lose any money from that. I didn't lose any, any materials. <laughs> you didn't so, lose your, your grant funding either. No, I mean in my days, in my daily simulations, not at the end of the day. But I'm not gonna lose. I'm not gonna lose anything. I can I can do whatever I want. So they are from this kind of covers the thing of how I can say that they are inexpensive. So the beauty of the computer simulations that we are doing in the field that I am is that we can really study the atomistic properties of materials how the atoms interact together, what is their geometry in the 3D space, and we can study a range of properties, which then experimentalists, they can use to explain and rationalize their experimental data. Or we can suggest new experiments, or we can calibrate phenomenology. So it is an exciting field of research, and... uh, it's going to become even more popular with the increasing power of computers that we have. Hmm. You know, that is so, I, I'm just starting now from talking to all of these different scientists like yourself to piece together this, the power of these simulations. I was talking to a climate scientist and they can just change the little dials to determine the different carbon dioxide levels in the earth. It's basically physics, right? Mm-hmm. Um, climate scientists, science is another type of physics. So the, the power of computers to answer questions or at least run experiments you would never be able to ever yes. run is, mm-hmm. is really cool. I have a question, though, about these uh, atomic atomistic properties mm-hmm. that you are studying. It, what could you give us an example of what they would be like? What's uh, the, the person on the street would what would they how would you explain that to them? Mm-hmm. So we know that the, the matter the building blocks of matter, is atoms. Mm-hmm. And the Democritus, for years, he thinks that atoms is the fundamental aspect of matter. Actually, atom, you know that it comes from a Greek word. I, I teach that. Yeah, Democrates, yes. yeah. Yes. So, um, there's, a, there's a little video I show. I think it's from uh, the Cosmos program in the United States where he's at a party because I think he, was a, he liked to drink wine, this guy. Um, anyways, <laughs> so the atom means that it's something that it cannot be cut into smaller pieces. Essentially, this is what is this is what it means the Greek word atmitos. Uh, of course, now we know that this is not true because the atom is consisted from protons, neutrons, electrons, and then we have quarks. Anyway, so the atomistic properties that we investigate through these simulations is anything related to how atoms interact inside the material. The most simple thing, geometry in the 3D space. What does this mean? Coordinates. X, Y, Z, coordinates. So where is atom A is located with respect to atom B? And then if I know the coordinates, what can I calculate? Distance. How we, what is the atomistic property related to distance? The atomic bond. So through my simulations, I can actually calculate the coordinates of the atoms in the Cartesian, in the 3D space, and by calculating the coordinates of the atoms, I can give an estimation, a prediction, 
because this is what you may, I, I take a kind of an opportunity of what you said earlier, the predictive power of the simulations. I can predict what is the distance, the atomic bond between two species inside the material. This is a property related to atomistic simulations. Then there is a range of electronic properties of how, for example, the electrons are distributed around the atoms. I can calculate thermal properties, vibrational properties, a huge range of properties. Hmm. But the most simple thing is the atomic bonding. So I can say how the atoms are distributed inside the material and what are the distances between the atoms. Either it's a crystalline material where I have fixed kind of lattice positions in a periodic sample or if I have amorphous material, a glass, where the positions, I have a distribution of positions. They are not fixed. Now, if we scale this, like, uh, let's bring this up to less micro, more macro. Mm -hmm. Would this help a material scientist be able to understand why the thing that they're making does the thing that they do? Is that is that kind of one of the goals of your research? Too? So the idea that, that we do this kind of atomistic simulations from the microscopic point of view is that then we can collaborate with experimentalists who they measure in the lab some properties of anything related to this material, and then we can help them to understand some of their measurements. So I see, for example, I take a Raman spectrum. I take a spectrum of a material, and I see a peak in the Raman spectrum. How this can be related to specific atomistic, to the bonding of the material? An example about this. Uh, or we can actually do the simulations and propose new experiments. Or we can do the simulations and rationalize a behavior that it cannot be explained experimentally. Because, oh. because for all of the machines that we use to run experiments, all of the instruments, let's say, they have an offset. So and that means what, what I'm trying to say, they have a level of accuracy. So I cannot go beyond a certain level of accuracy. This is where we can come into play and try to explain beyond, let's say, the reach of an instrument that performs experiments. Hello, I'm Granny McDuff. Join me for a new story every week or listen to all of my stories anytime. You can listen wherever you get your podcasts. Go to storicmedia.com that's S-T-O-R-I-C-M-E-D-I-A dot com for more information. Now, as I was, uh, as, as you were talking to me uh, via ch uh of I chat about some of the stuff that you do, does this have to do with um, like quantum properties of materials? Uh, quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics, is, maybe, yeah, sorry. The quantum mechanics is an approach that we use to do the simulations. Mm. Why, so why, you, why, you need it then. You need quantum why, mechanics. Why we need quantum mechanics? Why, yeah. Why yeah. we need quantum mechanics in order to calculate energies. It is one of the most important things that we need to calculate is energies and forces. So we have, two, we, can, we have two approaches on calculating these things at an atomistic level through the simulations. We can either use predefined functions of the potential. From the potential, I can calculate forces. This is physics in a kind of a, a high school level. Uh, Either I can have a predefined function of potential where I can calculate forces, or we can use quantum mechanics. This method, well, there is a Latin term for this method, called ab initio. What means ab initio? With no prior knowledge, from scratch. So the only thing I need to know is the species of the particles. So I can feed in into my function what are the species of the particles, and then, through quantum mechanics, I can solve the, the very well-known Schrodinger equation, which means what? I follow an ensemble of these particles over time in order to screen their positions. And then, when I calculate the positions, I can calculate forces. And then I can calculate energies, 
and then I have all of the information at the quantum mechanical level I can extract about this set of atoms. <laughs> That's mm. amazing. It is very amazing. That I mean, is so cool. Quantum mechanics, uh, it's in Greece, at the high school level, there is no kind of information about quantum mechanics. Not even in the first years of the university. I remember third year undergraduate physics in Thessaloniki when I was studying. And we got introduced into these wave functions. Yeah. And into the Schrodinger equation and how I can solve the time-independent, non-relativistic Schrodinger equation to calculate energies. Uh, and then the Heisenberg's uh, principle. And then the Pauli exclusion. I was, uh, I was amazed. This is where also we started brewing this thing of doing simulations from this perspective. I yeah. love it. Um, I teach uh, I teach interbaccalaureate chemistry to high school kids in Canada, and while we don't calculate high level physics, we do talk about quantum chemistry. Basically, mm -hmm. uh, the Schrodinger equation, the Pauli ex exclusion principle, um, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, all of that, and the kids are fascinated because. As you shrink things down, they get weird. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you have to go from one type of physics to another because classical physics just doesn't work anymore. The same way. No. Yeah. For me, for example, the, um, the probability density of the distribution of the electrons around the nuclei, uh, when you actually start in realizing this, it is quite uh, mind-blowing. Right. Yeah. Are, you, are you talking about the cloud model that there's yes, uh, yeah, yes. the, uh, the SPD shells, right? So yeah. we have the electron cloud, yeah. which in kind of a mathematical terms is called probability density. Yeah. So we don't really know the position of the electrons at a given time. No. So we can, only we can only have an estimation of a distribution of positions. Yeah. Um, it, could, it could be anywhere in, in that for example, the, the sphere, yes. but you, you never really know where it is. <laughs> you will never really know where exactly it is. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, it's fascinating. Uh, it, it takes time to digest this yeah. information. It takes time to digest. That Do is, you know, it's now so you, you are a teacher, so you will understand what I'm saying. Uh, I actually started feeling more fascinated about science that I'm doing when I started explaining it to other people. Yeah. Gives because, you a little bit of goosebumps because you're you're imparting something that is so weird and it's almost like you're a wizard, hey? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you're, you're telling people stuff and they're like, really? Is that true? And you're like, yeah, Wingardium Leviosa, you know, yeah. Schrodinger's equation. <laughs> so, so this is funny what you say, why you say that, because I used to teach also some maths in a basic maths. So I, I used, I could solve, for example, a complex integral in one minute. Uh, but that was the only part because I had done it before. Right. So, yeah. but uh, my students, they thought that I'm actually a wizard or I'm very clever, <laughs> which is not true, which is not true. I mean, if we were making a measurement of the IQ levels, they were probably more, more uh, kind of clever than me. It's just uh, the experience. And mm -hmm. I had done it before. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if I go outside of my realm of what I know really well in, in, in chemistry, into biology, and somebody puts like a picture of a heart in front of me and I have to label everything, I, I probably would fail that. So it's just, it's just what you know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, Doc, before we move on, is there something that we should uh, keep in mind about the experiments uh, and simulations that you run? Yes, it is very important to understand that we can apply this kind of methodology the ab initio formalism through the quantum mechanics for the simulation of materials in a huge range of, of materials with a diverse uh, applications. Uh, for example, nowadays, I'm working on materials related to phase change memories. Of how oh, we can... What's that? What's that? So, <laughs> we, this is a type of material for, that is a kind of a candidate for the next generation of non-volatile memories. At the moment, in your, in your laptop, in your mobile phone, the memory device that you have is a silicon-based memory. So this kind of materials, the phase change materials, it's an alternative technology. I can store the information, the zero and one bits, into the two different structural states of the material. 
The zero bit is the glass, the one bit is the crystal. This is an example of materials that I'm studying at the moment. During my PhD, I was studying materials for nuclear waste applications. Wow. For how we can, for example, study the atomistic properties of materials for making better glasses for storing nuclear waste. Right, because that's how nuclear, nuclear it becomes nuclear glass, right? Yes. So yeah. it's, it's quite good to store nuclear waste in a glass because it's quite immobile. It has a quite long uh, storage ter- term, uh, expectancy of life, several kinds of things. Mm-hmm. But I'm just, I just gave you two examples of, my, of, of applications. It, it, it can, can be, be applied to anything, anything that's a material. It can be applied to anything. You yeah. only need your computer, your idea, and any material that you, can, you want to study or you want to apply to make a device. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's very, it's very good. It's very interesting. I'm so I'm so glad I'm talking to you. That's fascinating. <laughs> Thank you very much. One of the standard questions on the podcast is we ask our guests to share a pet story from their life. Mm-hmm. Um, Dr. K, would you be able to share a pet story with us? Uh, yes, uh, I will be. I, I was um, I was uh, thinking about uh, the life of my my late dog. Mm-hmm. So my dog died in January. Oh, I'm sorry uh, to hear that. Yeah. It was, it was very painful, uh, but I couldn't choose any kind of story from, from my kind of interactions in my life with him. So I decided to tell you a story about a stray cat. Okay. So when uh, we were living in Cambridge, we were living in a terrace house. You have you, do you know about this terrace house? It's a row house. It's a one house next to each other. And this house in the back garden, it had a little pond. So every day there was a cat, a stray, kind of a brown, uh, black uh, colored cat. She was coming every day to drink water from our pond. Okay. Every every time I was opening the door of the garden, she was so scared and she was going away. One evening, I remember it so vividly, this. One evening there was a torrential rain, thunderstorm. I saw the cat in the corner from upstairs, from the window, I saw she was trying to hide under the table in order to get protected from the rain. I went downstairs, I opened the door, and she came in. Okay, she didn't let me to she didn't let me to to touch her or to do anything with her. So I said, okay, let's close the door because rain is coming inside. (laughs) Every time I was trying to close the door, she was scratching it, she wanted to go out. So going out, in and out, in and out. So what, what did I do that evening? I spent the whole evening in the kitchen with the door open and the cat in between. She was inside the house, but with the door open and the rain was coming inside the kitchen. Oh, no. So I stayed up all night because I was scared to leave the door open and I didn't want her to go outside. But do you know what happened? From that, from that let's say, night onwards, I started gaining her trust. Oh, and do you know what we ended up having? We, ha- we ended up adopting this cat. So, so this cat, within the next uh, two or three months of that event, see, we were completely inseparable. She was coming upstairs to my office, wherever I was going. See, I was working. She was next to me. I was going downstairs. She was coming with me. Aww. And I was really happy for myself because I managed to gain her trust. Yeah. And, um, but everything started with that thunderstorm that evening that I that I stayed up all night because she didn't want to close the door so it's a pet story that I cherish and I always remember oh that is so sweet what did you wind up naming the cat (laughs) this is a little bit funny and I don't know if it is embarrassing and we call her madam because Madam, madam. Oh, madam. Oh, madam. Because, okay. because she was very, she was very particular. Oh, yeah. But then um, at the same time, and I don't want, I don't know if uh, it's related to any, it's not, it's not related to any advert. We were watching a television program in Netflix. Uh, I'm not going to say which program. And we had this expression for America. It's called Madam Speaker. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. So we gave her a surname, Speaker. So she was Madam Speaker. Okay. So every time we were going to the vet 
and the the vet the people there in the in the vets they were saying, "Ooh, Madam is coming, Madam Speaker. Hello, how are you doing?" <laughs> Gave her an air of uh, importance, I think. Yeah, she she was very important. Mm. Ah, that is a great pet story. Thanks yeah. for sharing. Yeah, it was very good. <laughs> The other uh, standard question we ask our guests on the podcast is to share a super fact. A super fact is something that when you tell people, it kind of blows their mind a bit. And my mind's mm-hmm. a bit like jelly from our talk about uh, you, uh, your, the simulations you run. But did, do you have a super fact for us? I, I have a super fact that is actually quite fresh. Um, here in Finland, two weeks ago, we had the inauguration of a new supercomputer which is the most powerful supercomputer in Europe hmm. and uh, one of the most powerful supercomputers around the world. So its inauguration was two weeks ago and it's called Lumi. Lumi. L-U-M-I. Okay. So there are actually two super facts about this machine. So listen to that. Okay. Lumi's computing power is equivalent to the combined performance of 1.5 million of the latest laptop computers. What? And if you stack these laptops on the top of each other, they can create a tower of 23 kilometer high. <laughs> it would be in outer space. It would be way in outer space. <laughs> <laughs> and there is another super fact, uh, which is actually quite environmentally friendly. Lumi is using 100% hydropowered energy. Really? And the waste heat that this machine produces, because it's a computer, and you can imagine uh, that there is some heat generated from this supercomputer, the waste heat will be used to produce 20% of the district heat of the area in Finland that is located. Wow, that is impressive. Yes. So they are taking advantage of this, apart from the work, the simulations, the forecasting, that I can use this waste and turn it into something useful. Hmm. So these are the two super facts related to this new machine that we have here in Finland. You know, the the computer that powerful, it's just so hard to wrap your head around. <laughs> like once once you get past like 100 the human brain has like troubles with numbers like that, like <laughs> 1.5 million laptops. Um, I'm pretty sure that might, you'd be able to run Minecraft pretty good on that machine. <laughs> I think uh, it, it might go quite fast. <laughs> <laughs> Are you an engineer, want to be an engineer, or would like to know how engineers think? Hi, I'm Aaron Moncur, host of the Being an Engineer podcast. We've created this podcast as a central repository for industry knowledge and best practices to accelerate your learning curve within the discipline of engineering. We've interviewed over 150 top performing engineers, including those from MIT, NASA, Apple, and even YouTube sensation, The Hacksmith. Find us, the Being an Engineer podcast, with the orange and blue logo on your favorite streaming service. Again, that's the Being an Engineer podcast. No, that is, that is a super fact. I love it. No problem with low. Now, our, just to follow up, will people have to rent time on this machine or is it going to be used for like specific purposes? Um, so the company that is uh, kind of managing this, yeah. it has, um, like this is also quite common for any supercomputer that I know in Europe. There are two directions. One is for scientific reasons which is usually the accessibility for scientists from Finnish universities is for free. Mm. So we just have to submit the proposal and then that proposal can be granted for us with now money. But then companies, uh, they can use the facilities in order to do some forecasting or some predictive modeling. Uh, I don't, uh, I'm relatively new in Finland, but as I mentioned, I spent uh, seven years in UK so the, the, the equivalent machine in England, I know, for example, that BBC, the television channel, is using it 
for uh, weather forecast forecasting. <laughs> I know. Course. Of I know course, it's just an expensive weather person. <laughs> yes, I bet you it's still gonna get seven day seven day forecast wrong. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also, Formula One teams like Jag- Jaguar or other teams they can use this machine in order to run some simulations. Oh. So for for company based simulations, you have to pay. But well, for scientific based matters like us from the universities, for us the accessibility is for free as long as you have an affiliation with a university that is affiliated with the machine. Nice. So it's similar to the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, People put in their proposals, and then the proposals that are granted, they get time to use James Webb. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Very cool. So are you going to be putting in a proposal to use Lumi? Uh, Probably, yes. Oh, at the moment, so cool. <laughs> at the moment, we're using some other computers, which are still oh, okay. powerful for what we are doing. Nice. Uh, usually, just to give you an example, uh, I can run my simulations that I'm doing in 20 nodes. So, if each node has 24 cores, so this is kind of this is kind of the number of CPUs that I need to run my simulations. Kind of 480 CPUs. Okay. 400, yeah. <laughs> So it's, you need you do need powerful computers. Yeah, I mean the um, the fact that we had this uh, huge development in computer architectures, it helped for this kind of field of science, simulations and computational material science, or any kind of computational science to explode. You know, it makes me excited for the future because a supercomputer just begets another more powerful supercomputer. And what is accomplished with this computing power begets further understandings and breakthroughs. Um, I feel like we're speeding up too. Do you feel that too? Definitely. Uh, yeah. I, I actually sometimes, I feel that the machinery is speeding up faster than the human brain can cope. I mean, with, with w- just the data, you just can't wrap your head around how to actually use something yeah. powerful. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard that before. Mm-hmm. My mind is blown. That is a super fact. That is a super <laughs> fact. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Of so, course, uh, of course. Just, just a quick. Yeah, sorry to interrupt you. No, go ahead. There go are ahead. there are hundreds, not hundreds. Let's say, let's say hundreds. Let's be let's be exaggerate. There are hundreds of super facts in science, in kind of fundamental science, that if you digest them and understand them, they will blow your mind. <laughs> from microscopic to mesoscopic to macroscopic to mega scale and uh, I'll just give you kind of flash um, we said about the probability density of electrons we said that the atom is not an atom it consists of protons neutrons electrons and then we have quarks and how do we know that this is there is nothing even smaller than that uh, another super fact is that the light that we see from the stars in the sky is probably from a star that is already dead. Oh, like the yeah. ones the far, that are far away, like billions of yeah. years, light yeah. years away, yeah. Which gives you an indication, if you understand and absorb this, it gives you an indication of the distances and the expanse of our world. Yeah. Uh, I, I can go on and on, right? If you have time, I can, we, I can go on and on with these super facts that science can give us that if we digest them and understand them, uh, we will stay and say, oh, <laughs> I, I, I mean, we need to understand and love how science can help us to become fascinated. Yeah. I strongly believe this. We can be fascinated by these things. And we don't need only just to study complex maths or complex physics or how to solve the, the complicated things. Understanding concepts this is a this is a big thing that we can teach students. We can also do outreach for people like you do. One of the reasons that I follow you, and I, I, this is I'm not exaggerating. One of the reasons I have Twitter is for you. Aww. I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed. One of the reasons, not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it's there is so much fascin- There are so many fascinating things around. That we can we can just learn. We don't need to be 
You don't need to be doctors like me. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to stop here because if I no, carry on. That is then... so good. That's so good. Um, critical thinking and curiosity, I think, are two of the most important things to impart on students. Be curious and think critically. Um, yeah. And that's that's what science is. You have to be curious and you have to think logically. You have to be think critically. Be able to like figure out what's actually going on. Absolutely. Hmm. Well, super facts, super discussion. Love it. Um, the last section of our podcast, we get to know our guests a little bit more. Uh, we talk about hobbies or causes and your your things that you're passionate about. Um, you mentioned like if you weren't doing stuff with computer simulations in physics, you would be working with animals. Do you want to talk about that briefly? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh I'm now 37 years old, right? And since the time I'm remembering myself, uh, let's say 16, 17, 18, I always wanted to study physics, to do research or to teach uh, at several levels. So to anything related to physics, either at a teaching level or a research-based orientated level. Uh, recently, some people, they ask me, oh, if you didn't... Be if you were not a physicist and if you're not doing research, what you would have liked to do? And my answer was actually pretty straightforward, and I didn't have to think much. I said to them that if I ever leave my job that I am currently doing, I would be extremely happy and satisfied, satisfied to do any job related to dogs in particular or in general animals. <laughs> I I think that the animals are probably the most fascinating species on this planet. I mean, they're, they're pretty cool. Yeah, pretty cool. And at, at so many levels. So if I could do a job or a work or a voluntary thing or anything that my daily tasks are related to dogs or other animals, then this would be my next Career move, career stage. So it was, it was, it was a very easy for me. I didn't have to think. Some other people where we were in that company, they had to think, mm, what can I do? How I can utilize my degrees, uh, my skills? I don't want to use my skills for any other thing. <laughs> That's awesome. I, can, I can use my skills for many other things, but I, can, I don't want to use my skills for any other thing. If, I want to, if I'm going to do another job, this needs to be related to these things. That is a super wholesome answer, Doc. Thank you very much, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's a great place, I think, to wrap up, just with the warm fuzzies of your final story there. I love it. Thank do you have a Do you have a social media account that people can follow if people want to connect with you? I have my Twitter. Okay, what's your Twitter handle? K underscore D-I-N-O-U. All right, we will make sure that there's a link to that in the show notes so people can find you. All right. You take care of yourself, Doc. And thank you again for talking to us from Finland. I know it's uh, very late for you now. Um, I so appreciate you giving up your time to talk to us and our audience. Thank you very much, Jason. You have been a great host. Well, we were hoping Adam would get better, um, but he got a flu slash cold and he's been out of commission for three days. He's not well enough to run the family section. He's taken time off school and marching band. Um, he's got a really bad headache, and that runs on my side of the family, so I feel for him. So there's no family section this week. Look for Adam to come back next week. That's it for this week's show. Thanks for coming back week after week to listen to our show. I'd like to thank our special guest, Dr. K, who talked to us about physics and relativistic particles and things that were way over my head, but he brought it down to a level I think we could all understand a little bit better. I'd also like to give a shout out to the Paw Pack. And the Paw Pack is switching from Patreon to a community. Um, the community is called the Paw Pack Plus. We're really excited about this and there'll be some more information in the next couple weeks. Stay tuned. Chris, let's hear the names. GB Elby, Tracy Domague, Anne, Julie Smith, Sharon Dotson, Andrew Lynn, Elizabeth Parmente, Peggy McKeel, Sandy Brimer, Tracy Halberg, Jenny Jaguer, Chris Kelly, Leela Periello, Sam, Catherine Jordan, Donna Craig, Debbie Anderson, Courtney Proven, Renee Hardy, Jody Ogren, Mary Ryder. 
Shelby Leggett, Mary Coops, Marianne McNally, Elizabeth Bourgeois, Karen Beth St. George, Liz Button, Kathy Zerker, Ben Rathert, and Bianca Hyde. For science, empathy, and cuteness. Uh, <laughs>